I'm going to show you and test the strength of some common joinery methods that you can do with the tools you already have in your shop so you don't have to go out and buy an expensive domino or any other joinery system. What's that? The elephant in the room? Yes, I have contacts now. Oh, the shop? Yeah, I moved. You can't just use any joint for any situation. Unlike dominoes and dowels, you need to select a traditional joint based on the direction of the two pieces of wood you're joining together. The joints I'm going to cover first are all useful if you want to join the two pieces of wood together like this, as opposed to like this or this. Think of it like joining a table leg to an apron, or making a frame for a picture, or a frame for a frame and panel. There are quite a few options to choose from, and they're not all equal, but some of them are simpler to do than your favorite YouTuber's domino. Like a miter. They're a great joint if you're looking for grain that flows around the joint and you don't want to see any end grain on the edges. If your work pieces have a profile or detail of any kind, a miter can make that shape flow around the joint like a picture frame. Miters are a great looking solution for joints, but a good looking miter joint does not a miter gauge make. For that, you need a dedicated miter sled like this one that I was inspired to make after watching David Picciuto's video. If made well, this is a foolproof way to ensure that your miters turn out as crispy as a kettle chip. Gluing miters can be a pain if you're not set up for success. Collins miter clamps are great if you can hide the indentations that they make, but 45 degree clamping calls will call your name if the Collins clamps are to crash. Both of these solutions will work if making a complete frame, but I also love bang clamps for frames too, but they do take some practice. But is a miter joint really that strong? Isn't it just a bunch of end grain glued together? Conventional wisdom suggests that gluing end grain isn't actually that strong, but there was a fellow named Patrick Sullivan who made a very convincing video that appears to disprove that line of thinking. Now, I'm not here to jump that far into the weeds, but I can show you how strong a joint is relative to other joints of the same size, which might give a more practical guide for what joint to choose if strength is your number one priority. Remember this? This is the testing jinx some of my kind commenters told me that I stole from Matthias Wandel. And yeah, I did steal it from him because he is smart and I am just a silly goose. I made five of each joint and I will break each one with my super scientific jig here. The joint clamps here, then the bottle jack puts pressure up on the joint while simultaneously putting pressure down on the scale, which is gonna measure the force it takes to break it. I did modify it to include this lever right here, which divides the total load on the scale in half because I was kind of worried that these joints were all going to be so strong that it would exceed the scale's limit. And because of that, I'll have to double the number on the scale to get the actual result. For each joint, I'll remove the highest and lowest values for a crude but consistent way to remove outliers, and then I will average out the middle three results. I'll also include a butt joint as a control because seems like the sciencey thing to do. Miter joint numero one. Slowly. Are you joking? Well, that was a lot down. <laughs> the miter really wasn't much to write home about, but it did score over twice the strength as the butt joint did at 187 pounds for the miter and 79 pounds for the butt joint. So even though the miter seems to be just a bunch of end grain, it's really not. Clearly there is a better bond with the joints cut at a 45 degree angle over a straight up butt joint, while it also slightly increases the amount of surface area for the glue to use. But is it strong enough? Enter the spline. You can put a spline in any miter with just your table saw, and if you're making lots of picture frames, I highly recommend making a jig like this one that rides on your fence, allowing you to repeatedly and accurately cut these slots. You can basically raise your blade up as high as it can go without going over. If you don't trust your planer to mill down the splines thin enough, you can double stick tape your spline material down to a flat sheet of MDF 
or you can also sneak up on the perfect fit on a table saw using feather boards to keep things consistent. A while back, Jason Hibbs of Bourbon Moth made a video about joint strength and his splined miters were the strongest in his test. So I was fully expecting this joint to blow my mind, but it was kind of a letdown. Sure, it came in stronger than just the regular miters at 271 pounds, but I don't know, it didn't really give a satisfying snap. It just kind of stretched apart. But I suppose that could be considered a good thing that there's no sudden moment of failure. But there is plenty of warning that your table will fall apart if you keep using it as a stage for your at-home Fiddler on the Roof productions. To be fair, Jason was using a splined miter in a different orientation, like if you were going to make a box or a case. So perhaps it's still stronger for that scenario. And look, I will test that scenario too. I've already made all the joints, but I'll get to that later. The other thing to note in his video is that he is squeezing the joint together as if you were closing a book, whereas I'm opening the metaphorical book. At any rate, this just confirms the limitations of any joint strength testing. There are 101 ways that a joint can break and it's really hard to account for them all. But these types of joints tend to be the weakest in this racking or rotational direction, so that's why I tested them this way. All I know is that I tried to maximize the size of my spline by raising up my blade as high as it will go. All the same, the mitered spline is a great looking joint, particularly if you like to create accents with contrasting wood tones. If you want the clean look of the miter but are doubting its strength for your application, then a spline fits the bill rather nicely. But be sure to double check the grain direction on your splines because it's easy to mess this up. And I know, I've done it wrong many, many times in the past. The grain needs to be perpendicular to the direction of the miter. Conversely, if you put it in the same direction, it'll be as helpful as ChatGPT was for creating a simile for how helpful a spline is when the grain is pointing in the wrong way. It's as helpful as a chocolate teapot? The granddaddy of joints in this category is the mortise and tenon. This thousands of year old joint is traditionally used in all walks of woodworking like carcass construction, timber framing, chair making, etc. because it's apparently the strongest. Or is it? The great thing about modern machinery is that we do have a whole host of ways to accomplish this ancient joint. The most accessible way to create a mortise is with a plunge router, taking several shallow passes until you're down to your desired depth. Clamp some extra boards to your workpiece to make your router more stable and use a fence to guide you. There are fancier router base plate jigs you can make or buy to make things even more foolproof, but they're not a necessity. The matching tenon can be done with a handheld router, a router table, or my preferred way, a table saw. One tip I like to use is to size the width of the mortise so that your tenon shoulder height is the same on all four sides. Then you don't have to adjust the blade height when cutting the tenon side. The rule of thumb is to make the mortise and tenon thickness about one-third the total thickness of your workpiece. But I have been known to go a bit thicker, up to one-half the thickness of your piece, because for some reason I like to think I'm smarter than common wisdom. I could probably make a video about each joint and make a whole series of tests within each to determine the parameters that could potentially make the strongest version of that particular joint. But that is not today. If you can convince me to do it, maybe I will, but I'll have you know, I don't bend to peer pressure easily. I'm not gonna lie, it's definitely more work to do a mortise and tenon over a miter or some of the other joints that you'll see later, like the bridle joint. So what do you actually gain with all that extra effort? Strength? Indeed, you do. It averaged about 335 pounds. Not too shabby. And if you want a joint that looks about as innocuous as a butt joint, then the mortise and tenon is the way to make an extremely strong joint without anyone knowing that you put a considerable amount of effort into creating it. And since no one really knows how much effort woodworkers tend to put into anything we create, 
it's really the ultimate woodworking joint. Now the strength of each joint is interesting. It's cool to know some numbers behind the joints that we use, but realistically, the splined miter, the mortise and tenon, and the other joints you'll see next are gonna be more than strong enough for most furniture applications. And if nothing else, you should just try all these joints and more, because you know, woodworking is fun. The half lap is like the handshake of woodworking joints. When executed right, it's strong, firm, and instills confidence. But when it's done wrong, it's weak, clammy, and a disappointment to your family name. There are so many ways to cut a half lap, it's bonkers, but I like to do it on my table saw. If I am lazy, which is often, I'll use my regular blade and just nibble away at it. If I'm feeling a little fancier, I'll switch to my flat top grind blade so I can get a smoother result that no one will validate me for. But if I'm laying down legions of laps, then a dado stack makes making multiples merry. Another great thing about half laps is they're not just limited to joining two pieces together into an L shape, but they can also be used to make an X or a T. And creating angle joints is easier with a half lap than many of the other joints that I've talked about thus far. So therefore, the half lap is more versatile than many give it credit for. One trick to nail the correct thickness for your half lap is to roughly put your blade to just under half the thickness of the workpiece. Take a scrap piece of the same thickness, then run it over your blade twice, flipping it over to the opposite side so you're just left with a thin little bit. Then raise your blade up a little and make the same two passes. Keep repeating this until the thin little bit just about disappears, and when that happens, that is the perfect blade height. Wow. Jeez, <laughs> that was frightening. <sighs> when I snap the half lap, every time it made the loudest bang so far, and it felt like it took an enormous amount of pressure to break it. It averaged at 509 pounds, which is insane because this is one of the easiest joints to pull off and it beat the heavyweight champion of the world, the mortise and tenon. Keep in mind that the glue surface area of a half lap is about the same as a mortise and tenon, that's about half the depth of the workpiece. Well, cheese whiz, if a half lap is that good, then a whole lap must be even better. In case you didn't know, there is no such thing as a whole lap, but there is the bridle joint. What's the bridle joint? Well, if the mortise and tenon and the half lap consummated a marriage, they would poop out this. This is similar to a tenon, and this part is similar to a mortise, but if you cross your eyes, it kind of looks like a half lap in double vision and I would say it's almost as easy to make as a half lap and definitely easier than a mortise and tenon. The trick is to use a sled similar to the one you use to make the splines for miters. In fact, this is the same jig that I used to make the splines for the miters. I just modified it to work for me here because I'm too lazy to make another one dedicated to bridle joints. The brilliant thing about the bridle joint is, is that you only need to set this up once to cut both sides of the joint, which is unlike the mortise and tenon. Just like the half lap, the bridle joint works well for angle joinery too. You just have to ensure that you can safely angle the workpiece on your sled. They also look great in a mid-century modern setting for those angled apron to leg situations. So since this joint is like two half laps put together and therefore twice the glue surface area, shouldn't it be like twice as strong as the half lap? <laughs> As a quick aside before I go into the results, you're probably thinking that, gee, there are a lot of other types of joints out there, like the dovetail, the rabbit, and the box joint, and the list goes on. Well, I'll be honest. I made all these joints for situations like drawer boxes and wall hung cases, and I got started testing them, and I quickly found out that I couldn't break them the way I wanted. That is a lot of pressure already, and this is just a butt joint. That's crazy. So I concluded that I would break the video in half instead of breaking more joints in half. So the bridle joint, strong, yes? Yes, the bridle joint came in at 542 pounds. 
but compared to the half lap, it's certainly not twice as strong, only just a little bit stronger. But compared to the Mortis and Tenon, it's quite a bit stronger even though they do resemble each other. But this shouldn't be too surprising as there is about twice as much surface area in the bridle joint as there is in the Mortis and Tenon that I made. But it was about as deep as I can make it with a quarter inch router bit. Well that was a lot, and I am sure there's hundreds of joints that I didn't cover, but I wanted to show you the most popular ones that ain't too flossy for the average home hobbyist woodworker, and that can be done with either a table saw or a router. Bye!